You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 110, the September Campaign Part 2, Polish Rearmament. Last episode, we discussed some of the political developments that had occurred in Poland in the years before the war. This episode, we are going to focus solely on the developments of the Polish military. The Polish military that would meet the German invasion in 1939 was not a backward-thinking, poorly equipped military by the standards of Europe at this time. There had been a large amount of investment made to try and equip the Army and Air Force with the best military equipment available, but there were limits to what a smaller nation like Poland could do. It would be the limit on resources and not incorrect assumptions about how the war would be fought that would be the greatest problem for the Polish forces in September 1939. This episode will revolve around how that military was prepared, first looking at the military budgets of the 1930s before moving into a discussion of the equipment that the money would be used to purchase before closing out with discussions of how the Polish military was organized. All of these items are crucial to understanding why the Polish campaign developed as it did, and the plans for national defense were created, which we will discuss next episode. They were all driven and constructed within the constraints of the available equipment, which, for Poland, was quite limited. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, looking at military spending between nations can be challenging because it never directly translates between the different currencies. Even with exchange rates, when they are available, it still isn't perfect because some things are just more expensive in some areas due to resource availability, trade agreements, and the availability of local manufacturing facilities. What we can look at is the percentage of total GDP that was spent on the military, which shows us how much of the funds available to a nation were being spent on military-related items. Unfortunately for the Polish military, the total size of the resources available for Poland was greatly impacted by the Great Depression. The entire Polish economy was hit hard, particularly by the drastic reductions in agricultural export prices, But more directly related to military production later in the decade, coal exports also dropped by about a quarter and steel production dropped by one-fifth. By 1938, most of the Polish economy had recovered, but it still hindered the critical early years of rearmament. During the period of 1935 to 1937, Poland would spend about 10% of its GDP on defense, with the number increasing after the Munich crisis, and by 1939 it had greatly increased, at least in comparison to the number from earlier years. But the problem that Poland could never solve was that its enemies were spending massively more because they just had more resources. During 1939, Polish military spending was dwarfed by what the Germans were spending at the same time, and for the Germans, a much larger percentage of their spending was done on new equipment and expanding their capabilities, but because the Polish like raw number was so much smaller, by necessity, most of it was spent on basic upkeep, maintenance, and basic infrastructure. They did, of course, try and buy or build new equipment, which will be discussed shortly, but there were limits. During these years of spending, there was also the option to kickstart spending by getting foreign loans, an option that seemed far more likely and possible after Munich, uh, when both Britain and France started to become far more concerned about the possibility of a war. 
But the simple problem was that both of those nations were also in the midst of massive rearmament efforts. This made the governments in Paris and London hesitant to give large enough loans to Poland for the purchase of impactful military equipment. It was also made it difficult to justify spending, sending military goods to Poland when it was felt that both the British and French militaries were desperately in need of, of basically the same equipment and the same supplies. The Polish government would make official requests for some financial support to both governments, but both would simply delay providing large amounts of money. This delay would continue until it was too late. And by the time that funds were made available, it would prove to be largely too late for goods and equipment to be purchased and then sent back to Poland before the German invasion. While the Polish military had not fought a war in almost 20 years, but nobody else had either. And this meant that they had some of the most recent experience in fighting in Europe due to their experiences in the Polish-Soviet War. And during the interwar period, those who had fought and led units during that Polish-Soviet War were still prominent figures in Polish military planning. That war had been very different than the fighting during the First World War, particularly on the Western Front, which is where the British, French, and German experiences were concentrated, with the Red Army's invasion being a war of constant maneuver and improvisation. This experience would influence how Poles viewed a possible future war. To this end, a committee was set up in 1935 to make recommendations on what should be done to kind of prepare the Polish military for what was to come. The result was a six-year rearmament program with the goal of greatly increasing the motorization, anti-tank capabilities, and the communication infrastructure of the Polish military. The hope was that once these changes had been made, the Polish forces would be capable of being successful at what was being asked of them, which was not really an indefinite defense against either a German or Russian attack. This was because, even as early as 1936, when German rearmament was still really getting started, the Polish War College would define success for the Polish military as maintaining a defense for six weeks. That's all they were trying to do, was six weeks. It was not the most optimistic view of what would happen in case of a war, but it was a pretty realistic view of what a war against Germany would look like in 1939 at least before the Soviet Union also invaded. The hope was that however many weeks the Poles could hold to their defenses would provide time for their allies in Western Europe to begin their own offensives, to begin to pull German strength out of Poland. In theory, if everything went well, all the Polish forces needed to do was hold the line against the first German attacks, absorb these early efforts, and then wait for the threat to Western Germany to force the Wehrmacht to reposition its forces. If the goal was to mount a defense that bought time, the obvious answer might have been a series of fixed defenses on the border with Germany. In the late 1920s, a study was done by the Polish staff, but the overall recommendation of the study was mixed. The general recommendation was that it would be good to have some fixed defenses to aid the defending units in their defense, particularly in some of the border regions that where an inevitable attack would occur, like places that was known that the German army would have to move through. But even in the areas where defenses were recommended, there would only be some construction before the war. One of the major problems, and this is kind of a recurring theme here, was that there were resource problems. Fortifications were expensive, and they did not provide a lot of flexibility. This was a real problem for Poland, which was both resource-constrained, but also had a lot of threatened border to defend, not just the border with Germany, but also to the east and the Soviet Union. There were also areas where the amount of defenses that would be required were out of proportion to the usefulness to overall defense, like the Danzig Corridor, which the Polish army didn't want to abandon, but also didn't want to pour all of its money into the Polish Corridor. Both of these reasons were combined with the fact that many, if not most, Polish political leaders and military leaders believed that a future war would be more dynamic, with movement and maneuver being key, and that it was better to spend the money on bolstering the capabilities of Polish reserves and counterattack forces rather than building a bunch of bunkers along the Polish frontier. Speaking of dynamic combat, movement, and maneuver, we have to talk about cavalry. The most persistent myth about the Polish campaign is undoubtedly the one about the Polish cavalry charging German tanks with nothing but their lances and sabers. It's a complete and total fabrication, and we'll get to that, trust me, but Poland did have a sizable number of soldiers and cavalry units, 
But the amount of cavalry in the Polish army was already in decline by 1937, and as a percentage of the total manpower, it would drop from 14.2 to 8.1% from 1937 until the start of the war. Beyond just their numbers, there were three key facts that have to be understood about the Polish cavalry if their presence and actions is to be properly analyzed. The first is that almost every army in the world still had cavalry units in 1939, including the German army, and many of those armies still had cavalry troops that carried a saber, and sometimes even a lance, just as the Poles did. The second key fact is that for Poland, the cavalry gave them a level of mobility that was not possible in any other way. Poland would struggle to meet its goals for motorization and mechanization of troops due to its small domestic manufacturing base, and without the ability to motorize units, the second best option to provide mobility beyond the speed of walking was through putting men on horses. This mobility had been crucial during the Polish-Soviet War, where the battlefields had been very wide open, and it was believed that during the next war such mobility would also be an important ingredient for success. As part of the Polish plans for a war with Germany, cavalry was seen as an important way to respond to German attacks, allowing a certain number of men to see action or, or you know, act as reserve for a far greater area of the front. The third key fact is how they fought. Just like almost every other cavalry force around the world at this time, the Polish cavalry was not going to line up abreast and execute a medieval charge. Instead, their goal was to use the mobility provided by their mounts to move around the battlefield, and then engage the enemy often in dismounted combat. And though mobility was not just limited to moving men with rifles, cavalry brigades would be able to call upon machine guns and anti-tank guns if required. There were never enough of these items, or of artillery, but that was true for Polish infantry units as well, and at least the cavalry units could move these pieces of equipment around quickly to position them in advantageous positions at a moment's notice, something that the infantry could not do. When Cynthia came to TurboTax, she had just launched her new side gig a true crime podcast. I'm a first-rate detective with a golden voice. As her TurboTax expert, I made her second income count by guaranteeing 100% accurate filing and her maximum refund. <clears throat> what did she do with that refund? Find out next week. Switch to Intuit TurboTax and make your moves count. See guarantee details at TurboTax.com guarantees. Experts only available with TurboTax Live. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty. And about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today. And join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode. Where I'd like to tell you a story. There was an effort to build out Polish armored units during the 1930s, but as with in other areas, the Polish military was starting from a position of weakness. Polish society was far less reliant on motor vehicles than its neighbors, with the total number of civilian motorized vehicles in all of Poland being somewhere around 24,000 in 1936, whereas the number was around a million in Germany. The lack of domestic motor vehicle industry in the mid-1930s would hamper efforts to expand the domestic production of vehicles of all types for the military. This meant that the Polish military was dependent on imports of foreign models, but efforts would be made to change this. What funds that were available were invested in expanding production capacity, and to help things along, a few foreign models would be purchased for licensed production. This included a light tank from Vickers and a tankette in the early 1930s. 
The purchase of foreign designs was common for nations that were trying to build up their own design and production capacity, because it was much easier to produce a known design rather than try and produce a new design. In the case of the armor designs purchased by Polish firms, small adjustments would be made to the designs, but they would remain largely the same. Then, by 1939, Polish industry would be capable of producing quality machines, not just of foreign designs, but also of domestic designs that were just entering production. They would never be able to produce them at the same quantities as the Germans or the Soviets, but they were able to create the capability of production. Unfortunately for Polish armed forces, the war started too soon. The 7TP light tank had started to enter service, but the new medium models were just a few months away from entering production and then entering into unit service. But in some ways, having more tanks would have caused even more fuel shortages, which already greatly reduced the ability of the Polish army by the summer of 1939 to sort of work with the units that they had. Even with the problems, there would be both armored units and an increasing number of motorized units created in the Polish army by the summer of 1939, including efforts to motorize cavalry divisions. The Polish army would also have 10 armored trains in 1939, and I'm going to be totally honest with you, I cannot be objective here, I think armored trains are really cool. The Polish trains were generally quite old, with many being left over from the Polish-Soviet War, but they still mounted artillery pieces and machine guns. We'll chat about these armored trains again when we start discussing the actions after September 1st. They, they would not be game-changing pieces of equipment, uh, but in my mind, that does not make them any less cool. Along with tanks, the Polish military would have all of the other types of equipment that other nations would have by this point in history. One example would be radios, really as many of them as they could either buy or produce. At the lowest level, communication would be provided by field telephones, generally the AP-36 model, of which there were about 20,000 in use by the time of the war. As part of the 1936 modernization program, this was taken a step further, and funding would be made available for the design and production of the N-2 radio, with 10,000 radios being ordered. The plan was to equip every unit down to the battalion level with one of these radios to improve coordination and communication. At a higher level, the N1 radio would fill the same role at division and higher levels. Both of these radios were completely capable of doing the job that was being asked of them. The Germans would even copy and use the N2 after the Polish campaign. And there were at least, you know, several delivered during the summer of 1939. About 1,400 N2s and 65 N1s would be in service at the time of the invasion. The problem for the Polish army wasn't necessarily the technical side of using radios, but instead the actual, like, theoretical and practical use of radios. Because the proliferation of radios came to the Polish army quite late, it meant that officers and staffs of the army did not have very much practice in actually utilizing them. It was one thing to create the communication links, but it was another to be able to use them to their fullest ability, and to develop the processes that would allow for the increased availability of communication to actually be useful. These processes and general familiarization with the benefits of radio would have been provided by pre-war exercises, but by the time that radios were available in the numbers that they needed to be, there was no time for such exercises to take place before the invasion. There were similar strides made in the anti-tank capabilities of Polish units, a process that would begin in 1935 when 300 Bofors 3.7mm anti-tank guns were ordered and the production license was purchased to allow for domestic production. The goal was to eventually have over 3,000 of these anti-tank guns spread throughout the divisions of the army, but less than half would actually be available in September 1939. There was also the domestically produced WC-35 anti-tank rifle, which was highly effective against tanks that it could penetrate, of which there were hundreds in the German army during the invasion. But, and you're probably tired of me saying this, it was not present in the hoped-for numbers. Similar to the process that was followed for the Bofors 3.7mm anti-tank gun, 44mm anti-aircraft guns were also purchased from Bofors along with a production license which was purchased in 1935. 
Only about half the hoped for numbers were available in 1939, and while the anti-aircraft guns were towed by tractors, they were still vulnerable on campaign and this caused them to be concentrated in certain areas. In larger artillery pieces, similar efforts were made, but even fewer numbers of larger artillery guns would prove to be kind of available at the time of the war. At the start of the war, most of the artillery in each Polish division was still the older 75mm gun, the design of which had been inherited from the French after the First World War. There were a few larger guns sort of in play, but only six of the 42 guns provided to each division were 105 millimeters or above, compared to German divisions where 48 guns were of that size. Artillery would end up being much like the medium tanks, where a final design for a domestically produced 155 millimeter howitzer was about to enter production just months after the war started. One area where the Polish military would have particular success had little to do with equipment or production capacity, but was instead in the area of military intelligence. There were two levels of military intelligence that any military needed. The first was tactical intelligence, or the ability for the army to determine the position and movements of specific enemy military formations during the time of war. In this area, there were some problems, with few aircraft being available and the reconnaissance units being under-equipped when it came to radios and other equipment. But in other areas of intelligence, particularly strategic intelligence, the Polish forces would do very well. The strategic level was more about enemy organization and intentions at the army and government level, and to this end, the Polish general staff would already have a spy ring in Berlin in the mid-1920s. Over the time that it was active, it would be able to get copies of many Reichswehr planning documents, which gave the Polish military real insight into how the German military was planning for a war, even at that early date. The investments made even at this early date would continue to pay dividends as the Polish intelligence services would have some of the best information about German intentions and capabilities in all of Europe. They would also break the early Enigma encryption in the early 1930s. And even in the late 1930s, when German encryption was much more difficult to crack, they were still reading up to two-thirds of all German military traffic. Now, of course, all of the equipment in the world is useless without the soldiers to use them. And in Poland, those soldiers would go through a peacetime conscription regimen, whereby they would serve for two years of active duty, and then they would transition into reserve formations until the age of 40. This meant that the bulk of Polish soldiers were always in the reserves, with there being roughly 1.5 million of the reserves in 1939. Of this number, somewhere between half and two-thirds of the army would be in infantry divisions or would fight as infantry, which was more than the German army, at least percentage-wise, but it was generally required due to the lack of equipment to support more divisions of other types. This lack of equipment, especially trucks or other motor vehicles, meant that Polish infantry divisions were totally dependent on their own legs to move around, with rail transport being available where possible, but beyond the rail network, they were always walking. To put things in perspective, at the time of the invasion, the German army had 69 battalions of motorized infantry. The Polish army had four. This did not mean that there were no mobile forces in the Polish army. It would, you know, enter the war with 70,000 men in cavalry units, which would be very valuable as a quick reaction force. Even in defeat, these cavalry were quite useful because they were often able to escape from the German attackers, where infantry units were frequently overrun or surrounded. This was one of the real benefits of motorized, mechanized, or cavalry units during this period. They could run away. During the summer of 1939, the number of men who would be fully mobilized would increase from 300,000 to 500,000 due to the growing threat of war and about 430,000 of those would be infantry. But to come up to full strength, the Polish army would still need a period of mobilization, which would not be provided. They needed this time because many units would not be up to full strength when hostilities commenced, because they relied upon reserve units and reserve manpower to bring them fully up to strength. Each infantry division would plan to receive about 6,000 additional men at the time of mobilization. One of the interesting features of the Polish army is that it did not have the equivalent of a core level formation. Instead, the Polish army had divisions, and instead of having set division groupings, which would be organized permanently as core, 
Instead, they would make semi-ad hoc operational groups based on the objectives of a set of divisions. This is why we will be talking a lot about Polish armies named after geographic locations, like the Krakow Army or the Pomors Army or the Modlin Army, just to name a few examples, instead of something like First Corps, Second Corps, First Army, Second Army, those types of things. The theory behind this different organization was that it would provide greater flexibility to the army when required. The disadvantage was that it removed a level of permanent organization and cohesiveness. Another unrelated problem, but one that ties into our earlier conversations, was the fact that the Polish army units, no matter how they were organized, had overall far less firepower than the German units that they were facing. This was apparent in smaller units, but as you moved up the the unit ladder and units got bigger, the disparity grew even greater, especially when you get to the divisional level. For example, a Polish infantry division, when you took into account all of its anti-tank and artillery assets, had only about 60% of the firepower of a German infantry division. This generally just made it less effective in the war in 1939. Firepower was incredibly important. Thank you for listening this week, and I hope you will join me next episode as we learn how the Polish general staff planned to use the resources that it had available to it to fend off a seemingly very likely foreign invasion.